Good day everybody, I'm Daniel van Nikkerk and I'm going to guide you through your church history manual. The manual contains out of eight lessons, where the first four is to do with the church in Europe and the last four to do with the church in Africa. Each lesson covers a certain time period in history. On the timetable here, we're first going to do lesson one, which is the ancient period. Then we will do lesson two, which is the medieval period. Lesson three will cover the reformation and lesson four, the modern church. In section two, we will move to Africa and we will see an overlap of time of these lessons. For example, lesson five, we will cover Egypt, which will overlap with the history in lesson one. Then we will cover lesson six, which have a big overlap with le lesson two. Lesson seven will overlap with lesson three. And of course, lesson eight will overlap with lesson four. Enjoy the course. Lesson one, the ancient period. The ancient period began about 30 AD with the book of Acts and lasted until 600 AD. The lesson is roughly divided into three themes. The persecution of the church, the development of the church's teachings, and the beginning of the monastic movement. The church has been persecuted at various stages under Jewish leaders and Roman emperors. The development of the church's teachings dealt with heresies and the church fathers who stood up to them. During this time, Christians felt a need for solitude and a life devoted to God, which resulted in the establishment of monasteries. The ancient period began with a small group of devoted Christians spreading the gospel and culminated in Christianity becoming the Roman Empire's official religion. Theme 1. The Persecution of the Church The ministry of Jesus brought about a radical shift in the Europeans' worldview. Jesus' teachings resulted in the establishment of the early church, which began in Jerusalem and gradually spread to the rest of Israel, Asia Minor and beyond. The apostles carried the church's message to the rest of the world after Jesus. Through his teachings and letters to the early church, the apostle Paul rose to prominence and influence. His work formed the basis of the church's teachings. The early church only wanted to practice their faith in Christ and spread the good news to others. They established house churches, as described in the book of Acts, and Paul visited them during his missionary travels. Paul also arranged for preachers like Timothy to visit these churches and teach them the word of God. Unfortunately, not everyone shared their joy at the good news. Jewish community leaders saw them as a threat to their power base. Early persecution began with the execution of Christian missionaries the Jewish leaders. Stephen, the first recorded Christian martyr, was assassinated outside Jerusalem, Acts 7 verses 58. The martyrdom of Christian missionaries is described throughout the book of Acts. Persecutions were sporadic and localized, but they did not end with Jewish leaders. The Roman emperors saw the church as a threat as it grew. Nero used Christians as a scapegoat to burn down a section of Rome about 30 years after Stephen's death in the year 64 AD. His persecutions were also sporadic and localized. He was rumored to have murdered Christians by using them as human torches to light his gardens at night. Nero was also responsible for the death of Paul and Peter. In the year 81 to 96 AD, about 13 years after Nero's death, the Roman Emperor Domitian began the second persecution of Christians. He was a firm believer in traditional Roman religion and personally in, ensured that ancient customs and morals were adhered to throughout his reign. Domitian was tolerant of foreign religions as long as they did not disrupt public order. But Jews and Christians were persecuted heavily near the end of his reign. Domitian, according to the church father Tertullian, was as cruel as Emperor Nero. 
the Domitian persecutions were sporadic and localized. Shortly after Domitian, Emperor Trajan launched the third round of Christian persecutions, which last from 98 to 117 AD. In a letter to Emperor Trajan, Pliny the Younger, a magistrate, pleaded that Christians did not deserve the violent violence committed against them. He explained that despite the fact that they had never broken any Roman laws, thousands of Christians were killed every day. In his letter to Pliny, Trajan revealed that the Christian church was spreading throughout Asia Minor and influenced every aspect of society. Trajan's persecutions were also sporadic and regional. Marcus Aurelius reigned from 161 to 180 AD, more than a century and a half after the Christian Church was established. He was also a Stoic philosopher, known for his writings called Meditations. The Stoics believed that human uh, perfection could be attained through personal effort, relying on a superior external being to atone for their sins was directly in opposition to the Stoic way of life. Marcus Aurelius was mostly preoccupied with state affairs and was deeply invested in pagan Roman tradition. He was not inclined to examine the influence of Christianity objectively. Instead, he listened to his advisors and continued his predecessors' persecuting policies. In short, Aurelius deferred his final decision on Christian persecution to the advice of religious experts devoted to the state religion. This too was sporadic and localized. Septimus Severus initiated the fifth persecution in 192 AD. During the first half of his reign, he was not hostile to Christians. He even entrusted his son's upbringing to a Christian nurse. However, the advancement of Christianity alarmed the pagans, who motivated the false statement against Christians in the empire in 192 AD. Severus issued an edict prohibiting further conversion to Judaism and Christianity in the year 202 AD. Persecutions continued to be sporadic and localized, particularly in North Africa and Egypt. But the Christian Church grew despite of this. Tertullian stated that if the Christians had collectively withdrawn from Roman territory, the empire would have been greatly depopulated. Emperor Decius launched the first empire-wide persecutions of Christians from 249 to 251 AD. He believed that the Roman Empire's polytheism was declining as a result of the early church rapid growth and expansion in Asia Minor. Despite the fact that the church was a small minority, their the efficient and self-sufficient operations that did not rely on the state irritated him. He did not command Christians to abandon their faith, but he did demand that they observe one pagan religious observance. Christians who took part would be given a certificate of sacrifice and would be cleared of any charge of undermining the empire's religious unity. As expected, many Christians succumbed to the pressure. Others paid bribes to obtain the certificate, but the large number refused to compromise and died as a result. Emperor Diocletian wanted to abolish Christianity completely from 303 to 305 AD, about 50 years after Decius' persecution. His persecution is also known as the Great Persecution of Christianity because he was a gifted organizer. It was the final and most violent clash between the old and new orders. The Ecclesian first edict forbade all Christian worship and ordered the destruction of church buildings and Christian books. Two more edicts were were mandatory in the eastern provinces, or ordered clergy to be arrested if they did not offer sacrifice to pagan deities. The edict have been extended to all Christians by 304 AD, and it was particularly harsh in Africa. 
This was the second empire-wide persecution of Christians. As a result of these persecutions, Christians gathered in secret, mainly in the homes of wealthy members. Because the persecutions were mostly sporadic and localized, it was only necessary to meet in secret in the areas where the persecutions were enforced. The general church grew further, with church leaders or bishops leading Christian communities in their respective regions. Some Christians denied Christ as a result of the persecution and later want to join the church again. In the church, this is referred to as apostasy. Remember the sacrifice, the certificate of sacrifice, where many Christians buckled under pressure and others paid bribes to obtain it, only to return to the church later? It sparked debate about whether these people should be allowed to return. Because the gatherings were held at night and in secret, the level of hostility towards them increased. It was claimed that they were engaged in orgies and cannibalism, which stemmed from a misunderstanding of communion practice. Several church leaders were assassinated during these persecutions, for example Ignatius, Polycarp and Justin Martyr. During Emperor Trajan's visit to Antioch in 110 AD, the apologist Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, became a target for persecution. Ignatius was imprisoned and sent to Rome after confessing his faith in Christ. According to legend, he was rushed to the arena near the end of the public performance and thrown to the lions who killed him. A few years later, in 115 AD, the apologist Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, at the age of 86, was executed for his Christian faith. In the mid-2nd century account of Polycarp's martyrdom, officials begged him to say, Caesar is Lord, and offer incense in order to save his own life. He flatly refused. Later in the arena, the governor asked him to swear an oath by the luck of Caesar, but he refused. Despite the apparent eagerness to meet his end by beast, peace fighting had been declared illegal for the day. So he was burnt alive instead. Justin Martyr was the most influential apologist who died during Emperor Marcus Aurelius' persecution in 165 AD. He, like the emperor, was a philosopher before becoming a Christian. Soon after his conversion, he published a book called Dialogue with Typho the Jew, in which he compared Christian high ethics to those of pagans. He declared that Christians are the protectors of all those in need. The wheel eventually turned, and the persecution came to an end. It was not through human effort, but through the Lord's provision. It began with Emperor Galerius in the eastern Roman provinces, about six years after Diocletian's death. In the year 303 AD, Diocletian issued the final edict of persecution against Christians, at the request of Galerius. Galerius later acknowledged that his policy of eradicating Christianity had failed. In 311 AD, he issued the Edict of Sadika, or the Edict of Toleration, which officially ended the uh, Diocletian persecution of Christianity in the Eastern Roman uh, provinces. Constantine became emperor through a Roman civil war shortly after the Edict of Sadika in 312 AD. He had a dream about fighting under the cross, so the next morning he painted the Christian cross on all his soldiers' shields. In the following conflict, he defeated the army twice his size. Constantine issued the Edict of Milan the following year, in 313 AD, to ensure the freedom of Christians in the western Roman provinces. This provided Christians with legal status and in the empire, as well as protection from persecution. In the year 380 AD, roughly 70 years after the Edict of Milan, Emperor Theodosius I declared Sinin Christianity as formalized at the Council of Nicaea, the official state religion of the Roman Empire. Theme 2. Teachings of the Church 
As the Christian movement grew and developed into organizations, various leaders known as bishops began teachings that clashed with the other views of the church. Between the year 113 and 116 AD, the Bishop of Sinope, Marcion, began teaching that the God described in the Old Testament was less powerful than the God described in the New Testament. He did not accept most of the early writings that were later included in the New Testament, although he did acknowledge certain letters of Paul. During the years 300 and 336 AD, Arius of Alexandria, Egypt, became renowned for his teachings on the nature of God. His doctrine came to be known as Arianism. He taught that Jesus did not share the same eternity as God the Father, according was the first creation of God, who then subsequently created the rest of the universe. The beliefs of Arius therefore contradicted Jesus' equal divinity and the Trinitarian character of God. From 313 until 355 AD, Donatus, the Bishop of Carthage, was profoundly influenced by the Ecclesian persecution of the Church. He believed, for example, that true believers were those who confessed Christ during persecution, and that the priest's prayer ministry required him to be without blame. These teachings reject Christ's righteousness as the basis for our acceptance by God. Pelagius, a British theologian who lived from 380 to 418 AD, advocated man's free choice. Adam's sin did not taint human. Therefore, humans are still able to choose between good and evil without divine guidance. He was labeled a heretic because he denied original sin and grace and promoted law as the way of redemption. From 350 AD, the belief of Nestorius, the Archbishop of Constantinople, regarding Mary, the mother of Jesus, were viewed as contentious and sparked serious disagreement. He poses the issue, how could Jesus Christ, who was partially human, not be partially a sinner, given that man is by definition a sinner since the fall? Therefore, Nestorius maintained that the Virgin Mary uh, should be referred to as the bearer of Christ and not the bearer of God. Council of Ephesus condemned his belief in 431 AD. Therefore, why was this an issue? It was vital for the Church to continue guiding Christians in their understanding and faith of God after the Apostles' ministry. Unfortunately, as with any young organization, opinions differed, and the Church Fathers had not yet reached consensus on many fundamental characteristics of Christianity such as God's divine essence. Tertullian, an early Christian scholar from Carthage in northern Africa, began his study of the Trinity between 144 and 220 AD, when Martian was an old man. He is the first known Latin author to employ the phrase Trinity. This put him in direct opposition to Martian teachings. Tertullian likewise criticized Marcion's interpretation and exclusion of portion of scripture, as well as his dualism in Greek. Tertullian had been be the father of Latin Christianity and Western theology. From 325 to 373 AD, Athanasius, a young archdeacon from Alexandria, defended Jesus' nature and argue against Arius' teachings that Jesus was created. He said that Jesus was God, and that he was the same as God. His teachings had a big impact on what the church decided at the first meetings of bishops in Nicaea. Later he was chosen to be the bishop of Alexandria. Even though Arius' teachings were declared heresy, it was still taught in the church. Athanasius was sent into exile five times each time because the Roman Emperor at the time supported Arianism. His creed, Jesus as my Redeemer, can't be less than God, is well known. Basil, the Bishop of Caesarea and the contemporary of Athanasius, also believed that Jesus is God and part of the Trinity. He believed he lived from 239 to 379 AD 
with the help of Athanasius, their beliefs affected the decisions of the Council of Nicaea and went against the teachings of Arius. Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo in North Africa and the contemporary of Pelagius, began to teach when Athanasius and Basil were quite old. In the years 350 to 438, he believed that without Christ's grace, people could not be free. He developed the concept of original sin and his books, The City of God, on Christian doctrine and confessions influenced the development of philosophy and Christianity. Augustine is regarded as one of the most influential church fathers. Diverging teachings with, with opposing viewpoints became more prevalent in the church's message. Even as the church fathers refuted heretical teachings, it gathered followers who divided the church. The church lacked a mechanism for speaking with a unified voice and judging opposing viewpoints. The solution came when Emperor Constantine I convened the General Council to settle the Arianism dispute. In 325 AD, the Council of Bishops met in Nicaea. The Council's purpose was to address Arianism and the nature of Jesus. With the help of Athanasius and Basil, the Council condemned Arius and emphasized the Son's absolute equality with the Father. Arius was then exiled by Emperor Constantine I. This was not the end of the Arius debate. The church was still divided into Western and Eastern branches, with the Eastern branches being the Strianism. The nature of Jesus has been addressed, but the nature of the Holy Spirit remained unknown. In 381 AD, Empress Eudocius I convened the Second Council of Bishops in Constantinople in order to establish a united church in the empire. This council condemned Arianism again and established that the Holy Spirit's nature as being one with, with God and the Trinity. Emperor Theodosius II convened the, the Council of Ephesus in 431 AD, the Third Council of Bishops, at the request of Nestorius, Archbishop of Constantinople. The council purpose was to address the differences in teachings about the Virgin Mary. Nestorius contended that Mary was the bearer of Christ, where Cyril, Patriarch of Alexandria, contended that she was the bearer of God. Nestorius hoped to pursue the counsel of Cyril's heresy, but his own teachings was, were ultimately condemned and regarded as heresy. The Council of Saldidan was the first bishop's council of the church. The Roman Emperor Marcion called it in 451 AD. The purpose of the council was to address a new outbreak of Nestorian and Arian teachings. This meant that God's Trinity was once again called into question. The council reaffirmed God's Trinitarian nature as well as, as the previous three council's decisions. Constantinople also hosted the fifth bishop's council. The meeting was convened in 553 AD by the Byzantine emperor Justinian I. Certain Protestant churches, such as Calvinism, only recognized the first four bishop councils, making this the first council that they reject. The purpose of the council was to bring peace to the church between the two factions that arose following the council of Ephesus. The opposing views were that Christ was two natures. God and human, versus that Christ only had one nature, divine. The council did not resolve the compete, but it did address other pressing church issues. The Byzantine Emperor Constantine IV convened the Sixth Council of Bishops in order to restore communion with Rome. It was accepted by the Roman Pope Agatu, and the council was held in 680 AD. The main issue they addressed was the one that had failed in the previous council meeting, namely Christ's dual nature. The monotheistic view of Christ's nature was rejected with the help of a letter written from the council, written for the council by Pope Agatu, in which he described Christ as having two worlds. Theme 3. The Monastic Movement Following Emperor Constantine's 
imperial support for Christian religion via the Edict of Milan in 330 AD, a new secular council arose within the Church. The faithful believers became increasingly concerned about the sinfulness and abuse of power. As a result, many purist movements sought to pursue their spirituality in, one, in a more puristic, less secular environment. They believed that the secular culture of the Church prevented them from living a spiritual life. As a result, they attempt to withdraw from the Church and live a life of devotion. It was as if the Church of Act had resurfaced, with these believers seeking out one another to discuss how to live a devoted Christian life. Purists attempt to live a life separate from, the, from that of the Church succeed. The Church political power in these societies stifled the development of a separate church communities and compel that all believers to join a single movement, the church. Finally, these believers looked at the example of Anthony the, the Great, who sold all his possessions and lived in a desert cave to devote his life to God in 285 AD. The Eastern Church had already established monastic life, which became the framework for the same movement in the West. Pothamius established a more organized way of life for monasteries in 380 AD. As someone who served in the Roman army, he based the monasteries on the barrack life of Roman soldiers. Benedict established a set of rules to govern the day-to-day -day activities of the monastery life in 516 AD, which became known as the Rules of St. Benedict. It structured the monast monastic community day around regular time of communal and private prayer, sleep, spiritual reading, and manual labor. Many monasteries still practice it today. We covered the ancient period according to three themes, persecution, teachings, and monasteries. This gives the impression that the events in these themes were isolated from each other. This was not the case. They did influence each other. To understand the relationship, one can view it on a timeline. This is what I am going to try to show you now. The period started with the Book of Acts, as we said, in 30 AD and continued until about 600 AD. We can see the centuries here at the bottom, the 1st century, and it continued until the 7th century. I have divided into persecution. I have looked at world events, just to make it more interesting. The heresies the Church Fathers, the Monasteries, the End of the Persecution, and the Council of Bishops. Right, we first have the death of Stephen in 35 AD, and he was the first recorded Christian persecution. And then about 30 years after Stephen's death, we got Nero who burned down uh, Rome in 60, he left from 54 to 68 AD. In 70 AD, just after Nero, uh, we have the destruction of, of Jerusalem, where the Romans captured it, and they destroyed the Second Temple. Right, Martian is our first heresy, uh, 85 to 160 AD. He believed that God of the Old Testament was inferior to the God of the New Testament. And then the Domitian persecution started. That was the second persecution, 81 to 96 AD. So that happened during the lifetime of Martian. There you can see that. It was followed by Trajan's persecution, the th third persecution of Christianity, in 98 to 170. Still, during the lifetime of Martian. And then in the time of Trajan, we have the death of Ignatius. The Bishop of Antioch was killed by lions in the arena. And in 115, the death of Polycarp, uh, who was burned alive to age. Then by the end of Marcion's life, we have the Church Father Tertullian, 155 to 220 AD. He is the one who coined the word Trinity, and he's seen as the father of Latin Christianity and the founder of Western theology. In his lifetime, we have Marcus Aurelius, the Stoic philosopher, 
and known for his writings of meditation, 161 to 180 AD. Uh, still in the lifetime of Tertullian, we have Justin Martyr's death, church father that died under, in the persecution of Marcus Aurelius. And then Septimus Severus persecution started, the false persecution of Christians, still in the lifetime of Tertullian. And then after Tertullian's lifetime, we have Odysseus. It was the fifth persecution and the first emperor-wide persecution. He was the one who issued the certificate of sacrifice, 249 to 251 AD. You see that the third century was relatively calm after the second century, the stuff that happened there. By the end of the third century, we have Anthony the Great, who sold all his belongings and retreated into a cave in the desert, 285 to 350, uh, 356 AD. Then in the lifetime of Anthony, we had Arius, well-known heresy, uh, we didn't recognize Jesus as God. And we have the last and sixth persecution of Christians, the second empire wide, the one of Diocletian. And we find that in that time, uh, we got Galerius who issued the Edict of uh, Toleration or Sedica after he seen that he couldn't destroy Christianity. Constantine's victory after he had a dream to fight under the cross. 312 AD, and then Donatus, who believed that true believers were those who confess Christ under persecution. We can see it's done during the Ecclesian persecution, and uh, that was a very severe persecution, and might be the reason why Donatus came to that conclusion. The Edict of Milan, who eventually gave uh, freedom to the Christian in the Western provinces, after the eastern provinces received it under the Edict of Sadika. Bosamius formed the first monastery. We, we know that Anthony retreated to the caves, but he went alone. Bosamius is the guy who actually started organizing it that others can go with him. So he organized according to the Roman soldiers by barracks. He himself was a soldier. Then we have the first council of bishops in Nicaea. And it was called by uh, the Emperor Constantine the First, the same guy who issued the Edict of Milan to give freedom to the Christians, and it was to to condemn Arianism, force the Church to make a decision around that. Athanasius, Athanasius played a big role in the Council of Nicaea to prove that uh, Jesus is God. And he, of course, was supported by Basil the Great, 339 to 379. Right, and after them, it, we find Augustine, uh, 350 to 430, most influential church father of the early church. He, his work laid the foundation of the Latin church. So we see that the first half of the 4th century was quite busy. He calmed down to the second half. The second half we have Pelagius, 418 AD, uh, advocated man's free will and taught that the sin of Adam did not taint human nature. He was the Englishman. And then in the second half of the 4th century, uh, Emperor Theodosius I uh, declared the scene Christianity as the official state of the legion of the Roman Empire. And we also have the Council of Constantinople, the first one, the second Council of the Christian Church. And they also confirm that the Holy Spirit is also part of the Trinity, 381 AD. Right, in the 5th century, we got the Council of Ephesus, 431 AD, third council, uh, confirmed that Mary was the bearer of God. And all these councils so far, it's all about the Trinity. The Godhead, the position of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And this one is also just to confirm that Jesus is God. And then in 451 AD, the Council of uh, Chaldeden, 
uh, fourth council of the Christian Church, right? We got a new outbreak of Nestorian and Arian teaching, meaning that they questioned the truth of Jesus, and uh, the council just reaffirmed the Trinitarian nature of God. And then we have the fall of the Western Roman Empire. So until this point, all the councils was called by the Roman Emperor, but from now on, it will be the Byzantine Emperor. Benedict created its rules. It organized a day of a monastery uh, community around the regular times of communal and private prayer, sleep, spiritual reading, and manual labor. It is still practiced today in many places. Then we have the, the Fifth Council of the Christian State at Constantinople, 553. It was called by the Bistidian I. And now they focus on the nature of Christ. Uh, Christ is human as is Christ human and God, or is Christ just God? And it was unresolved at that one. Moving into the seventh century, we actually have the Irish min uh, missionaries moving out into Europe, England, and to Europe. After the fall of the Roman Empire in 476, the whole network of the church also collapsed in Western Europe, and it was actually the Irish missionary who picked it up again. And then in six, uh, 680, we Constantinople, the third one, which is, yeah, as we said, it's the sixth council of the Christian Church, and it eventually resolved the two natures of Christ with the input from the Pope in Rome, and it did confirm that Christ do have two natures.